We're in 1 Peter chapter 2 tonight. We have three more chapters to go to conclude this particular book. Peter's the kind of guy that gives us all hope. (laughs) He had my disease, foot in mouth. (laughs) He was impulsive. He was always wanting to get to go and do and seemed like he was always making mistakes. The disciples were very human and Peter was the most human of of them all. You have the notes. Let's dive in. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon your word in Jesus name. The top of your page, 1 Peter 2, 11, and 12 as our theme tonight. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior And they will give honor to God when he judges the world. John the Baptist uh, baptized Jesus in the River Jordan. In Mark 1, which is really quick, it says that the Holy Spirit that came upon Jesus drove him into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan. When Jesus returned from that time... And he walked past John the Baptist again. John looked at his two disciples, Andrew and John, and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. They immediately got up and joined with Jesus and followed him. Andrew later went to see his brother and said, We have found the Messiah. And he brought Peter, Simon, to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, Your name shall be Peter, which means a stone. Shortly afterwards, John the Baptist was arrested. Then Jesus began to choose the twelve. First he went to Peter and Andrew, and he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. They joined him. He took another little short uh, trip around Galilee from where he was with Peter and Andrew. And he comes upon John and James, sons of Zebedee, who were mending nets. And he says to them, follow me. They immediately join with Christ and with Peter and with Andrew. The first four disciples Jesus chose were fishermen. It is not recorded in scripture that Jesus ever said to anybody else other than To Peter and Andrew, I will make you to become fishers of men. Which tells me that soul winning, which is what that is talking about, is not everybody's task. It was these two guys. The Assemblies of God took that one task of soul winning and combined it with two more. Teach those that are saved and praise God, worship God with all of your being and said, this is the reason why the Assemblies of God exists. To win the lost, to train those that are saved, and to worship God. In John chapter 21, after Peter had denied the Lord three times, the Lord said, lovest thou me more than these? And in each case, he gave John, or he gave Peter, Instructions on what he wanted him to do, and none of the three are soul winning. The first one is nurture the babes, the lambs, those that are babes in Christ. Nurture them. Number two, shepherd the entire flock. That would include all levels and all ages. And lastly, he said, feed or teach the adults. Nurture the children, shepherd the entire group. And feed the adults. Now let's fast forward from about 33 A.D. to 64 A.D. 
Nero has set Rome on fire in order to build himself a big house, and he blamed the Christians for it. He began persecuting the Christians, which included burning them alive. And when Peter says in chapter 1, verse 7, that the saints have been tested by fire, scholars believe by that reference that he is referring to what Nero was doing. And thus they believe that 1 Peter was written about 66 or 67 A.D. Shortly after, he wrote 2 Peter. By this time, he was in his mid-60s. The persecution that Nero started did not end until 313 A.D., when Emperor Constantine became the head of the Roman Empire and he made Christianity the state religion. 250 years of persecution. How old is the United States? That's how long. Long time, friends. How do you turn your worst of times into the best of times? In this chapter, chapter 2 of 1 Peter... We're going to find three steps. Repent, remember, and revive. Repent and listen. Remember your Christian position and revive your Christian duties. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Repent and listen. Therefore, laying aside all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking... As newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted the Lord, his gracious, the chosen stone and his chosen people will be what we look at next. We will look next at remembering who we are. Repent and listen. Peter is telling you and me, we must do this. We can do this. And it's up to us to do it. Malice is a word that means unforgiving spirit. It means holding ill will towards others. Do you ever give anybody the stink eye? Ladies, look right at me. Don't look at your husband. Okay. God. There was this. uh, This lady. She was in her 40s and she had been trying to find a husband for years and never could land one. And she had a friend that had had three husbands and all of them had had died for one reason or another. And she'd had them cremated and put in an urn and set them on her mantle. And so she went over to find out what the secret was of this lady that had been able to have so many husbands. And she was sitting there and they were having some tea and she looked up at those urns. She says, I just don't understand. You got husbands to burn and I can't even find one. (laughs) Guile is deceit. It's a devious spirit of using others. It's deliberate dishonesty, deliberate falsehoods. Peter is saying, put that aside. Hypocrisy, pretending to be something that you are not. Every year, Hollywood handles, hands out all these little trophies to the best hypocrite in a town of hypocrites. <laughs> Envy is at the root of pride. And fruit of envy is discontent. The root of envy is pride. The fruit of envy is discontent, which leads to covetousness. You want what somebody else has got because you think they're happy and you want to be happy too. It leads to resentment and resentment of others, and it'll turn you bitter. Evil speakings, which is slander, 2 Corinthians 12 Paul says it's backbiting. It's stabbing somebody in the back with malicious words and gossip and whisperings. Today, it's bullying on school campuses. Peter says, lay this aside. It's like laying, taking off dirty coveralls, set them aside, and don't touch them anymore. In Romans 13, cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Colossians 3, mortify your members which are on the earth. Ephesians 4, put off the former conduct of the old man, which is 
corrupt by deceitful lusts. It's not enough just to put things off. We need to put some things on, too. Some things we need to stop doing and some things we need to start doing. Do you know anybody that's talking the talk and walking the walk? Do you know somebody that doesn't? Uh, Washington, D.C. is filled with a bunch of... uh, Every every time that an election comes, it's an amazing revival takes place with all these people coming forward saying they're Christians. 1 John 2, 4 says, If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commands, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. When I look at politicians, I look at how they vote. Are they voting for murdering unborn babies? Do they promote and vote for and are shoving down our throats a sinful lifestyle and calling it a redefinition of marriage? Do they condemn the Jews for defending themselves? Do they ignore or defy the Ten Commandments? If they do, St. John says those people are liars. Jesus said to the Pharisees, If you were sons of Abraham, you would believe my words, but you are of your father, the devil. He was a liar from the beginning, and he is the father of all lies. God is not reaching out a feeble hand of compromise and saying, let's make a deal. He's sitting on his heavenly throne with bolts of lightning in his fist, and he's saying, this is the deal. Deuteronomy 30 says, God told the children of Israel, I set before you two paths of life. One is of life. And one is of death. And just in case you're hearing impaired, choose life. Because there will be a test. There will be a test. It's up to us to choose. It's God's gift and our choice. Which way do you want to go? Well, I don't like that. Well, I'm sorry. God's the one making the rules. I'm not. I'm just the postman. (laughs) The end of verse 2 begins with verse 3. They should be read together. Cry out for this nourishment. Now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. Repent. Throw off envies. Malice. Now listen to what God has to say. And obey. Jesus told Peter in John 21, feed my lambs, the milk of the word. Aldous Huxley wrote his book, Brave New World, and in it he was fearful that truth would be drowned out by a million noisier messages. The information highway has caused the average person to have analysis paralysis. You can't get it all. When you get on your computer and you look up something... An hour later, you realized you forgot to look up what you got on there for, and now you can't remember what it was. And all this time, God is still calling with that still small voice, and he's asking, will you listen? Will you listen to him? Will you listen to his word? Psalm 34, 8, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Jeremiah 29, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. John 9, 4. Be busy with the busyness while it is daylight. Night is coming on when no man can work. Repent. Repent means change your mind. Turn from the direction that you're going in and go in the opposite direction. Repent means to turn from to. It isn't a New Year's resolution where you stop doing something. You have to also start doing something. The opposite direction. And that's repentance. Repent and listen to God. Number two, remember your Christian position. When our first night in the introduction, I said, these words are not for everybody. They're They're not for people that are not saved. Peter was writing to those who had been converted and were following Christ. But they were having troubles. They were in the worst of times. And so I would say to anybody, join, be a part of what God's family is all about so that all of these promises and blessings and opportunities to have God Almighty, who is the all creative power, the all knowing God is on your side. 
and he will help you. <clears throat> Peter's prayer. Lord, save me. That's all it takes. And a person can be a child of God. Remember your Christian position. You are living stones. You are people of God. You are his children. Peter wrote this letter to believers living in five different nations. But he said all of them belong to one spiritual house. There is only one Savior, Jesus Christ, and only one spiritual building, the church. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone of the church, binding the building together. Whether we agree with each other or not, all true Christians belong to each other as stones in God's building. We are part and parcel of a bigger family. Verse 4 says, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. <clears throat> I'm going to come back to Matthew 16 in a minute. That's there for you. Verse 4, Jesus divides the whole world. To believers, he is precious. To the world, he is offensive and obnoxious. Jesus is either the living cornerstone or he is a stumbling stone. Peter said in verse 5, he is the living cornerstone and we have been made living stones in God's living spiritual house. We have been chosen by the living word, chosen to a living hope in the only living God. Behold, he who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps, Psalm 121. He is the God covenant of Abraham. He is the fire by night and the cloud by day in the wilderness. He is the great God and shepherd of David. He is the God in the fiery furnace with the three Hebrew children. He is the God on his throne with thunder in his voice and lightning in his fists. He is the God who rides on the clouds to the, of glory to rescue his own. He is the only true and the only living God. And there is none other like unto him. Amen. 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 Peter says in verse five. Spiritual house, living stones, holy priesthood, spiritual sacrifices. Sacrifices of righteousness in Psalm 4, 5. We are sacrifices of thank, give thanksgiving in Psalm 50, verse 14. In Hebrews 13, we present sacrifices of praise from the fruit of our lips. Paul says in Romans 12, we are to present our bodies living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God Almighty. Our reward for our worship is that we might bless and please God. Psalm 34, 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. When we turn church worship into something that we get instead of something that we give, the devil wins another battle. The purpose of worship is to glorify him. We cannot be brought together as one body unless we lift up Jesus who promised when he's lifted up, he'll draw all men unto him. That's how this nation will get rid of the division. When we lift up Christ, when we put him first and foremost in our lives, we can drag in the others who are on the fringes and we can confront those who are opposing us. And in Jesus name, have the authority over them to break the forces of the devil. We have the ability in Jesus name through his commission to us as the church to charge the gates of hell and the gates shall not prevail. Because of the blood of Christ that sanctifies and has the power over the demons throughout this world and in this nation that are turning this world upside down. You have the ability. Get on your knees and charge in Jesus name and break the binds and the bounds of Satan. Amen. Jesus also has he's divided the world. He also divides the church. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, which we find on the previous page, Matthew 16. 
that I didn't read to you. Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? Simon Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. What was Jesus talking about? Was Jesus talking about Peter as a rock? Was he talking about himself as a rock? Or was Peter's confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God? Is that the rock? The church world is divided over this. And only Jesus is going to be able to settle it when we see him. But we have a clue in Peter's own words. He says, as he quotes Psalm 118, that Jesus is the stone which the builders rejected. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. I think Peter was wanting the world to know that when Jesus said upon this rock, he was referring to himself. Verse 9. We are a royal priesthood. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In the Old Testament, no king was allowed to do the work of a priest. There was one king that did it in Second Chronicles 26 and God judged him. Saul tried to do that in 1 Samuel chapter 15. He got tired of waiting on Samuel to come do the sacrifices, so he did them himself. He was presumptuous and he performed the priestly sacrifice to God. When Samuel showed up, he said to him, Saul, you're done. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. Rebellion is as as witchcraft and stubbornness is as idolatry. Why is stubbornness like idolatry? Because a person who is stubborn worships their own opinion. They worship their own opinion above anything that God says and above anything that comes against them and shows them they're wrong. They will worship their own opinion. Stubbornness is idolatry. And this is what happened to Saul. And God took the kingdom from him and gave it to David. Peter says... As he quoted 118, it's Jesus Christ who is the rock. And we as priests unto him represent the living rock, the stone upon which the church is built. And it says a royal priesthood. The word royal is referring to kings. It's referring to royalty. He has said we are royalty and we are priests in him. Jesus in the book of Hebrews is called out after the order of Melchizedek because he was the king of Salem, which meant peace. And he was a priest unto God. And Christ has called us into that position. Believers not only make up the church, but they serve the church. Ministering as a holy priesthood, offering ourselves as sacrifices, living sacrifices to a holy God acceptable through Christ Jesus. As we sacrifice ourselves unto him, he gives to us the blessings of himself. The greatest reward that we can gain through our service to God is that he stamps on us his own image. Remember your position. Children of God, a holy nation, royal priests. Elevated to the position of being Christ's ambassadors here on earth as he has chosen you to be his living representatives. A little girl told her mama she didn't want to go to bed. And her mama says, well, you know, you know, just go ahead and uh, you, you go ahead and talk to Jesus up there and uh, he'll help you out. About a half hour later, she came back down. And she says, I need somebody up there. And she says, well, didn't I tell you Jesus would be with you? And she says, yeah. But I need Jesus with some skin on. (laughs) We are that. We are Jesus with some skin on for folks as we touch their lives. Revive your Christian duties. Verse 11, chapter 2. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, 
Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul, having your conduct and honorable among the Gentiles that when they speak against you as evildoers, that they by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. We're passing through. This world to us is temporary. We're on our way to a permanent home. Our souls are anchored in heaven, not in earth. We're not looking for a new city here. We're looking for a heavenly city there. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you and I will come again to take you to myself that where I am there you may be also is not here. If you ask anybody on earth, where is heaven? Everybody who is on earth, whether in Australia or in England or in Toronto, (laughs) will point up. And all of us point up away from earth because we know this place don't cut it. (laughs) There's this old man sitting on a park bench. Sorry. Got another one. <laughs> and uh, he was just bawling his eyes out. And uh, a policeman came up to him and said, sir, what's the problem? He says, I got a 10 bedroom house. I got an Olympic sized swimming pool. I've got two Corvettes, a Lincoln limo, a four by four pickup truck that's loaded to the teeth. And I got a 35 year old wife that can't keep her hands off me. And he's just bawling his eyes out. And the policeman says, wow, so what's the problem? The old guy looked at him and says, I can't remember where I live. (laughs) 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 Your your home's in heaven. You don't have to worry about (laughs) mansions here. (laughs) It's a separation of things of the flesh, things of the world. The flesh is a good servant, but it's a bad master. Not but just because of God's judgment against the things that keep us from being pure. We are not only to separate from things of the flesh, but we are to join to things of the spirit. Verse 12 Having your conduct honorable among Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works see your good works, which they observe and glorify God on the day of judgment. There's coming a day of judgment. We don't want to give those that are around us the excuse, shoulda, coulda, woulda. We want to give them the excuse, he lived the life in front of me, she lived the life in front of me. Verse 13, therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. I wish he hadn't said that. I don't like to submit, and I especially don't like to submit to some of the things that are going on. I don't agree with it. But, you know, it was a whole lot worse in Peter's day. A whole lot worse. And it was bad when Jesus was here on this earth. And when the Pharisees came to trick him, they asked Jesus, should we pay taxes? And Jesus said, well, you got a coin? And they said, yeah. And they brought him a coin. He says, whose image is on this coin? And they said, Caesar. So Jesus said, well, render to Caesar what's Caesar's and render to the Lord what's the Lord's. And they walked away. Wait a minute. There should be another question. Okay, that dollar bill belongs to Caesar. What belongs to God? Give to Caesar what's Caesar, give to God what's God's. That question gets another question. Whose image is stamped on you? That's what you give to God. Submission is not at the top of my list. But Jesus said, pay your taxes. Uh, I don't like the way my taxes are being spent. You knew you don't either. <clears throat> uh, 
It is something to really pray about. But you know what? If you stop to think for a minute, how many hundreds of years people that are Christians have been able to write their giving to church off on their taxes? It hasn't been that long. And if you stop to think what nations allow that, we're rather privileged here in the United States. So let us thank God that it's still that way. Peter is writing to people that are under the thumb of Caesar Nero. He's just as bad as Hitler was, except Rome expected Caesars to be worshipped like they were gods. And Peter says, submit to those that are in rule over you. Many of us quote Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, I know the plans I have for you to give you a hope. And we shout and we praise and we dance. But have you ever read the first ten verses? The ten, first ten verses say, God is talking to the Israelites and he says, I'm sending you into slavery. Obey your slave owners, build houses, have kids, because I have a plan for you. Well, I sure like verse 11, but there's ten verses in front of that that talk about bad times. And you can't get verse 11 unless you got the verses 1 through 10. You see, there is a promise and a hope and a glimmer of light, a silver lining in the dark cloud. That God has promised that through these troubles and trials that you face, he has a hope for you. Do you know what that was? I was thinking about this today, even after I read this and I got to thinking, you know, Jeremiah wrote this and they went into 70 years of slavery. There was a whole bunch of those folks that went in that never came out. Daniel was one of them. In Daniel chapter 10, he's praying to God that the 70 years is about to complete. He's asking God, would you only make it 70 years? Would you make sure when the 70 year mark is crossed that now the people can return home? And because of his intercessory prayer where he sat down and he said to God, we have sinned. We have violated your law. We have chosen to worship idols. He never did. But he said we. And God honored his prayer. And he cut it off at 70 years, just like he said he would. There were people that were born in that slavery that got to go home. We may not see the day. That's the point. When deliverance comes. But it doesn't matter whether I see it or not. God's promise is that it's coming. And I will trust him and I will claim it. Even if it's for those that follow me that receive it. I'm going to believe him that he will do it. Freedom of the press is constantly promoted in the press. Isn't that interesting? There is all kinds of filth and foul that is allowed because it's a constitutional right. It's freedom of the press. How about freedom of the religion? It's in the very same constitutional amendment. The very same one says freedom of press says freedom of religion. But what do we have today? We have suppression of Christianity and promotion of everything else that's called, even not even called religion, that are religions. Darwinism, progressivism, secularism, atheism are religions. They worship that. But that's the world. I expect the world to act like that. But I don't expect the Presbyterian Church of the United States to approve of gay and homosexual marriages. They're supposed to be beacons of light. I would say to them, listen, what fellowship does light have with darkness? I would say to them, listen, if we make friends with the world, we are an enemy of God. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my father. And that's what that church has chosen to do. And this nation also, if it doesn't get its act together. Verse 15. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God's. The life that we live should be pure so that it silences the slander of Christianity. Galatians chapter five says this. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control against such. There is no 
law. We can do all of those. We ought to be doing all of those. If we're busy doing all of those in our Christian life, we won't have time for anything else. I'm talking about how you turn the worst of your times into the best of your times. First, you repent. Second, you remember who you are. And third, return to your duties. And this is them. That the fruit of God's Holy Spirit would be manifested through you. How do we get there? Prayer. Listen to God's word. Read his word. Be in touch with the Holy Spirit. Close yourself into your closet and get alone with your Savior. That he in communion with you might fill you with his presence, with his spirit, with his power. So that you could live like this. And when you do, your worst of times will become your best of times. Respect everyone, but love your Christian brothers and sisters the most. Honor, verse 17. Honor all people, but love the brotherhood. Fear God and honor the king. One of the greatest heresies that's ever been perpetrated on the church has been the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of men. It's a lie. There's only one way that you're going to be able to call God your father. There's only one way that you can call others your brothers. That's through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only way to become a child of God. He is the only way through him that we can look at each other as brothers and sisters. It's in the Lord. It's through him. Verses 18 through 25. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the harsh. Thank God some of us have had good bosses, but it hasn't been all that length of time. After 43 years of working, I've had some real stinkers. And I've had to live a life before them. I'm sure you have too. Because God has called us to be honorable regardless of what our bosses are like. Jesus is our example. He obeyed the civil law. Remember, Jesus was asked about the taxes. Remember that one time when he told the the, uh, disciples, go down to the brook, grab this big fish, open his mouth, there will be a coin, go pay our taxes. And it happened. They didn't get a write-off. They didn't have a 1099. (laughs) They didn't have 401ks. (laughs) Uh, uh, one of the fellows that uh, uh, attends here, he likes to tease me uh, every once in a while because I have two retirements. And he says, John, are you still double dipping? I says, as long as it keeps coming, I'm going to keep dipping. <laughs> and he just laughs. Are you triple dipping? He says, oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how long it's going to last. My hope is not in that monthly paycheck. My hope is in the Lord. As Christians, we must exercise discernment in our relationships to the human government. There are times when the right thing is to set aside our own privileges, and there are other times when using our citizenship is the right thing. Paul was willing to suffer personally in Philippi. Remember, he was beaten and put in jail. But he was unwilling to sneak out of town like a criminal when they found out he was a citizen of Rome. When he was arrested on false charges, Paul used his citizenship to protect himself. And to insist on a fair trial before Caesar. The Declaration of the Independence and the United States Constitution are Christian documents. Don't let anybody tell you different. No other religion in the world says what the Constitution says. All men are created equal. Only Christianity says that. Even Judaism doesn't say that. And this nation was built on Judeo-Christian principles. But only Christian principles and Christian belief says... All men are created equal. Jews don't believe that. They believe they were created better because they're sons of Abraham. Only Christianity says we have been endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights as life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. All men created What is the college's teaching? 
evolution and our document that built this nation upon which they spew their lies says we were created by a divine God. Christian beliefs are what built this country and Christian beliefs are under attack. Shall a nation destroy its own foundation? That was a question in the Old Testament and it's what's happening now. Someone may argue, but as Christians, are we not free? Yeah, we're free in Christ for others. That we might live for others and share with others the truth of the gospel. Paul said, pray for your government so that it will continue to allow you to pursue your Christian duties. Pray that nothing drastically changes to prohibit you from worshiping God. Those things are under attack now in the military. We need to pray for our military personnel. We need to pray for our police, for our fire. When they stand up for God, when they stand up for Christ, they're under attack. Let's pray for them repeatedly. Repent and listen to God. Remember your Christian position and revive your Christian duties. When we submit to the authority of Christ Jesus, he will redeem us and make us kings and priests unto our God. And he sh- we shall reign on earth with him. Revelation 5. A true Christian submits himself to the authority because he is first of all submitted to Christ. We are going to exercise, if we are going to exercise authority in the kingdom of God, we first need to be under authority. Jesus said the Roman centurion who knew about having authority and being under authority had more faith than anyone else in Israel. The prodigal son was never truly free until he was back home under the authority of his father. Moses submitted to God and he led the Israelites out of Egypt. Joshua submitted to God and he led them into the promised land. David submitted to the name of God and brought down Goliath. Jesus submitted to God the father. He went to the cross. Now, God has given him a name which is above every name. That at his name every knee shall bow. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want to thank Pastor Tim again for this opportunity to share with you God's word. We have three more chapters ahead of us. And uh, as the Lord leads us, we will be back again next week to look into his word and be blessed and encouraged under the power of the Holy Spirit. Pastor Tim, if you would come, sir.